is a substance so strange and so beautiful that whenever people encountered it, they thought they'd found something magical. And its magic is real, because this material has traveled through time, bringing with it passengers from the distant past that have wonderful tales to tell. This extraordinary substance has fascinated me since I first held a piece, this piece, when I was 12. My first piece of amber arrived in a very unexpected way. In 1938, during the build-up to the Second World War, my parents helped some of the many children fleeing from Germany. They had left their families behind and were allowed to bring almost nothing with them. I remember one girl in particular. Her name was Marianne. She was 12, about the same age as I was, and she came from a city on the Baltic coast where her father was a doctor. He had given her one small but precious thing as a sign of his thanks to whoever it was who was going to look after his daughter. And this is it. It felt surprisingly warm and light in my hand. But what made me fall in love with Amber was what I discovered inside it. I found something miraculous. There were insects preserved in astonishing detail. I burned with questions. What sort of world were they from? They must have lived a long time ago. But how long? Years later, my brother Richard would play a scientist in a movie which made Amber famous the world over. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Richard's character extracted DNA from dinosaurs' blood trapped in amber, and with it brought dinosaurs back to life. Could that ever be done? I started my journey with the amber time machine by taking Marianne's gift back to where it came from, to the shores of the Baltic Sea. The amber comes from rocks on the seabed some distance out from the coast, but people don't find it until it washes up on the shore. Little bits like this are quite common. Sometimes, if you're lucky, particularly after storm, you can find bigger bits. Some even have barnacles still attached to them. People have been collecting such bits for thousands of years, but had no idea how amber originated. Some said it was solidified sunshine. Some uh, that it was the tears of the gods. And then, around the year 77 AD, a great Roman naturalist, Pliny the Elder, conducted a simple experiment. He did this. smell unmistakable pine resin. Several types of plants, among them conifers, seal any wound inflicted by storms or insect attack by producing a sticky resin which oozes out from them. And because it continues to gently flow around whatever it traps, it can preserve creatures in the finest detail. As the resin hardens around its captives, they become suspended in time. Of course, many creatures are fossilized in rock, like this small flatfish, for example. It's a kind of ray. It was squashed 
its soft parts decayed, even its little spines turned into rock. But amber preserves creatures in a quite different fashion. When this little bee touched this drop of resin, she was caught by its stickiness, and she was instantly and perfectly preserved in three dimensions. These eyes saw a world which existed long before mankind evolved. She scented flowers before the first human being ever smelled one. And I can even tell that she was working hard when she died by the bundles of cargo on her hind legs. It's hard to imagine a more perfect time capsule than this. This little bee has been trapped in there for literally millions of years. Amber's ability to travel through time can take us back into more recent history. Our history. Stonehenge is one of the earliest man-made structures in the world. These stones have been standing here for something like three and a half thousand years. And we know that even then, the people who erected them treasured amber. But they weren't the first. It was considered to be precious way back in the Stone Age. And this may be why. When you scrape its rough surface with a flint blade, perhaps, you quickly reveal the wonderful golden colour inside. It's quite magical. Stone Age people also carved bones stone in order to make tools. But amber was different. It seemed to have had no practical use. So they must have valued it for some other reason. The carvings they made around 10,000 years ago give us an idea of how they viewed the world, and in particular, which animals mattered most to them. Imagine the value of amber to a Stone Age hunter who believed that capturing an animal's spirit by carving it in amber made the animal itself easier to hunt. The people who built the great stone circle at Stonehenge lived in the Bronze Age several thousand years later, but they too treasured amber. None but the wealthiest of them could afford a material as rare as this. Once there were a thousand beads in this necklace. Over 3,000 years, their surfaces had become opaque and crumbly. But when they were new and freshly polished and glowing, it must have been a wondrous piece of jewellery. The sun is central to our understanding of Stonehenge. The monument may have been used as a solar calendar. And it may be that its builders treasured amber because it captured the warmth and the light of the sun. It may or may not have been considered magical in prehistoric Britain, but it was most certainly rare, for it came from far away. This is the Baltic city of Gdansk in Poland. The jewellery worn by the people of Stonehenge and buried with them came from around here. It's evidence of one of the world's first long-distance trade routes. But what brought the big boom in amber was the rise of Imperial Rome. The Romans bought it for prestige. Amber carvings cost more than the best slaves, and even the Emperor Nero treasured it. He decorated the Colosseum with tons of it to show how unbelievably wealthy he was. So Baltic amber can take us back at least 10,000 years into our own past. But it reaches back much further than that. 
To find out how far, I went to one of the Gdansk workshops where amber jewelry is made to meet Elsbieta Sontag. Very thin. It was probably with inclusion inside. Elspieta is a biologist who comes here to look for inclusions, animals and plants trapped in the amber. Would that one be any good? Yes, I think yes. We can split it, for example. <gasps> really? Oh, yes. And? And maybe something is inside. How many pieces do you look at before you find some? Oh. About uh, 20. 20. 11. <laughs> not good. Shape is not good. Why is the wrong shape? 12. 12. Next one. 13. Spit? Yes. It's got a lot of bubbles. 14. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> My friend. Oh? No. Fifteen, nothing. Yes, I think so. Sixteen. Yes. It's a mosquito. No, mosquito, uh, midge. Oh, but this is beautiful. The midge looks as though it took off from its twig only yesterday. But amazingly, it has been frozen in flight for around 40 million years. So, what about the creatures in my piece? What exactly were they? I could see them clearly, for Elspieta's microscope had a projection screen. Ah, uh, well, that, that's an old friend, because it's quite big and it's near the surface and I've known it for a long time. And so it's a fly. But what kind of a fly? It's a long-legged fly. A long-legged fly? fly? Yes. And what part of the forest do they live? Low on the forest, sometimes sit on the bark. So the likelihood is then that, that this fly, and therefore this piece of amber, this gum, this resin, yes. was low down on low the tree? Low down on the floor. Okay, the what else is that? With her powerful microscope, Elspieta was exploring far deeper into my amber than I had been able to do. And there she found another fly, a fungus gnat. It must have died searching for rotten wood, for that is where it lays its eggs. Then Elsbieta found an aphid, and right above it, an ant. Perhaps they'd fallen together from a leaf where they were feeding. I think that's a fantastic picture. I mean, I, and it's deep in the amber, I know, because I've never seen it like this before. But the last animal she found was the most surprising. Ah, what a monster. What is it? There's a mite. A mite? Yes. A mite. Very small monster. Oh. <laughs> yes. And that's tiny there, isn't it? How big is that? About one uh, half a millimeter. Half a millimeter. I've never seen it before. So we've got a whole community and we know that they all live together because, because they all died together. And my one piece of amber and that alone has given us a whole rounded picture of a tiny little ecosystem at the bottom of a tree 40 million years ago exactly amazing thank you very much it had taken me more than 60 years to find and identify all the animals inside my amber and seeing them together had given me something more a glimpse of their world. By comparing many amber animals to modern forms, scientists like Elspieta are sure that the forest they inhabited was a temperate one. But how broad a picture can these time travelers give us? Could it encompass a whole forest or even a whole continent? Well, in the 1960s, on a Caribbean mountainside, science discovered a new source of amber, which seemed perfectly suited to answer those questions. 
I had a chance to visit it 15 years ago. I hoped that for the first time I myself might collect some amber. Here in the Dominican Republic, amber is mined, and by dating the mudstones that contain it, we can tell that it's about 20 million years old, rather younger than Baltic amber. Star, amber right? Hey. Buena. Picking a piece of amber from the mudstones in which it has lain for so long was hugely exciting. I brought a small collection back home with me. So, what kind of forest did this amber come from? Well, thanks to some remarkable detective work, we can answer that question in amazing detail. In this piece, there's a leaf from the plants that produce the amber. And this is what those plants look like. They were giant bean trees. But what matters most about them is not what they look like, but where they grew. They were tropical. Scientists had long imagined that the ancient tropical forests contained a vast diversity of life. But very few fossilized traces had ever been found until they discovered these. Dominican amber preserves such a huge variety of animals and plants with such perfection that it inspired two scientists, George and Roberta Poinar, to try something that had previously been thought impossible. In the same way that Elzbieta reconstructed the world around a single Baltic tree, they started to use these tiny fossils to bring a whole tropical forest back to life. I had found a piece which contained a little bee. She must have been familiar with many of the plants in that forest. Indeed, she depended on them. So, based on the Poinar's findings, and with a little bit of amber magic, we can follow her back home. This tiny flower shows that the amber trees were not the only giants reaching up into the forest canopy. It belonged to a sebo, whose great trunk is supported by wide buttress roots. But the commonest flowers of all came from a different tree, the Nazareno. It seems likely that these trees dominated the forest canopy. When one of these giants fell, it would have opened up a light gap, which other faster growing plants could fill, plants like palms. And here are their flowers, confirming that palms were another key element of that forest. So we have built up a picture of what part of the forest was like, and even identified some of the flowers which might have tempted my bee. But I don't think she died collecting nectar. She was searching the forest for something else. Remember those bundles on her back legs? They are clues to what she was after. She was collecting resin. And not just any resin, but resin from the amber trees themselves. And that was a very dangerous thing to do. She was a stingless bee, very skilled at handling resin. Even so, there was a real chance that while collecting it, a bee might get stuck. Stingless bees are among the most common animals trapped in Dominican amber. Why did they take the risk? Resin is very valuable to these bees. 
Mixed with plant waxes and fibers, it makes a strong building material for their nests. But it also brings another benefit. It contains antibiotics, which disinfect the wounds in the bark of the trees from which it oozes. By bringing it here into the nests, the bees protect their developing young from infection. So now we know exactly what this little bee was doing in that forest 20 million years ago. This piece of amber has not only trapped her body, it's also caught her behaviour. And we know from other pieces of amber too, that she had enemies. This is an assassin bug. It hunts stingless bees and their addiction to resin makes it easy for it to find them. The bug can't move swiftly enough to snatch a bee from midair, but it's strong enough to pull off strands of resin. With these sticky gloves, it can hold on to any bee which touches them. It's using resin to set a trap. Now the assassin stabs its dagger-like mouthparts into a weak point behind the bee's head and injects its saliva, paralyzing the bee. As she dies, she releases a pheromone, a scent calling for help, which normally rallies other bees to defend the nest, and that entices them into the assassin's reach. One assassin lost its grip and now lies in amber, together with its victim. Once small animals like this were in the resin's grip, they were as doomed as flies on flypaper. But even so, amber sometimes contains animals that normally would never go near it. How can George Poinard explain his next discovery? It was an amber tadpole. It couldn't have come into contact with resin underwater, yet when he looked further, he found other pond animals, a young marsh beetle, even a diving beetle. The challenge was to explain how they had found their way into a flow of resin on the trunk of a tree. This is a poison dart frog. She's only half the size of your thumb, and remarkably, she's carrying a tadpole on her back. These are what she's looking for. Plants that collect water, called tank bromeliads. No one has yet found a piece of a bromeliad in amber, but we know they were there because there are amber damselflies, of a kind which today lays its eggs between the tightly packed leaves of bromeliads. She's reached a branch. The tadpole will soon have a nursery. She lowers her rear end into the bromeliad's pond. Other animals also lived in these tiny ponds. Up here, they may have been safe from predators, but not, it seems, from resin. So, bromeliads held tiny, complete worlds high up above the ground. But even so, 
they probably didn't contain enough food to sustain a fast-growing tadpole. What then did it eat? Amazingly, the piece of amber that held the tadpole also contained the answer. Poison dart frogs are very attentive parents. Every few days, the tadpole's mother climbs back up the tree to the bromeliad to care for her youngster. She's laying an egg. That's what the other object was in the amber. These eggs are sterile and don't grow into frogs. They're food. But occasionally, these little worlds up in the branches were shattered. At least one falling tadpole came to a sticky end. Who would have thought that amber could reveal such intimate details of life in tiny ponds high up in such trees as these? But what about the bigger animals of the forest? Amber surely can't tell us anything about the presence or absence of these. Or can it? Remarkably, amber does contain evidence of one such creature, thanks to some very oddly shaped seeds. These are the seeds of a kind of bamboo. The hooks on them get stuck in the hairs of animals so that the seeds travel with them and so are dispersed. But what sort of animals carried these seeds? Well, sometimes such seeds have hairs that attach to them, and the only animals with hairs are mammals. There were certainly a number of mammals around 20 million years ago, but can these hairs help us to be a little more specific as to which mammals were here? They can. The shape of the scales on the surface of hairs varies, and George Poinar used them to narrow down the possibilities. They came from some kind of carnivore. So that's one more animal that I know that lived in that forest. But what about organisms for which there is not even a hair to serve as evidence? Amber really is astonishing, because as well as carrying animals' bodies through time, it can bring clues to their relationships. And that is what makes me certain that the forest contained enormous fig trees like this, although no trace of such a tree has yet been found in amber. Let me explain. George Poinar found the crucial evidence. Exhibit A, a minute wasp. This wasp proves that the forest had figs. But to find out what makes it such a conclusive witness, we need to see what goes on today inside the figs themselves. Although they look like fruit, figs are really containers for the tree's flowers and its developing seeds. But some also house wasps. Fig wasps spend almost all their lives inside figs, which are sealed. So nothing but a fig wasp can collect their pollen. And that is how the wasps repay the fig trees for providing their nursery, by distributing their pollen. These two organisms have come to rely on each other so closely that it's impossible for one to exist without the other. 
That is why a single wasp can guarantee that the forest contained fig trees. The partnership between figs and wasps is one of the most intimate in the whole of nature. But that piece of amber had something else to reveal, something that was rather more sinister. The rear end of the wasp is surrounded by minute nematode worms. As the wasps emerge inside a fig, so do these nematodes. Each has just a few minutes to find a wasp and burrow into its body before it leaves the fig. But these are not conventional parasites. The only thing they will take from the wasps is a free ride to the next fig. Only Amber could have preserved such minute details and with them revealed an extraordinary fact. The relationship between the forest fig trees, their wasps and worms that we know today clearly existed 20 million years ago. Amber again and again demonstrates this constancy. Take this, for example. It looks like a death scene, a scale insect in the jaws of a predatory ant, but the truth is very different. Scale insects drink the sap of plants, but this takes time. Predators would soon pick them off if it wasn't for the teams of ant bodyguards that protect them. And in exchange, the ants receive a share of the sap. By providing ants with food that they can't otherwise reach, the scale insects have made themselves indispensable. This relationship was so important that, far from eating her captive, this queen ant was gently carrying it away so it would set up a new colony beside her own. And for 20 million years, neither partner has had any reason to change. What does this astonishing absence of change imply? If conditions had altered radically, many of these complex relationships would have disappeared. So their presence tells us that tropical forests must have existed largely unchanged for at least 20 million years. But now George Poinar has traveled back even further in time. One of his latest finds in Dominican Amber takes us back not just 20 million years, but 150 million, for it has implications about the Earth's geological history. And this startling new evidence comes from a single ant. I've come across its modern relatives myself, and their behavior can tell us something unexpected about the Dominican Amber forest. They're honeypot ants, whose workers have become jars in which the colony stores honey to help it through times when liquid and nectar are scarce in the dry season. So this amber honeypot ant suggests that the ancient forest also had a dry season. And if the modern ants are anything to go by, then it lasted around three to four months. So now amber can tell us how often it rained 20 million years ago. But it's also evidence of an event that occurred even farther back in time, because the living honeypot ants I found don't occur in the Dominican Republic or even in South America. They live in Australia. So these little ants are evidence not only of climate, but the fact that once Australia and South America were joined together in one supercontinent. Who would have thought that a single ant could tell us so much? The amber time machine could hardly illuminate a more global event than the drift of continents, but it can also take us to the opposite extreme. What surprises might we find inside an amber animal? Dr. David Grimaldi of the American Museum of Natural History is especially interested in lizards. 
These Anolis lizards are very territorial, and the males take great risks to secure a patch of bark for themselves. They spend a lot of time displaying aggressively to one another, doing press-ups and erecting their throat flaps. And sometimes they fall. A few have achieved fame and immortality in amber. But such specimens are very rare. And not surprisingly, a lizard should be strong enough to unstick itself from a flow of resin. But some did not. And that puzzled David Grimaldi. He wondered whether they could be as well preserved inside as they were outside. Could he actually look inside an amber lizard? He turned to the latest high-tech scanners. These are scans that use very high uh, intensity x-rays that are too high for medical purposes. And we have incredible detail in any view that we want. This scan of a gecko's head shows the finest details of its skull and even its teeth. Amber's preservation is clearly more than skin deep, but nothing in this scan could explain why this gecko was trapped. So David Grimaldi turned to another gecko and looked at its whole body, this time with conventional x-rays. The x-ray revealed that the bones are beautifully preserved. Bones of the skull, delicate little toe bones, bones of the legs, and even individual vertebrae are revealed. But from the jumble of bones, it's clear that the gecko's back was broken. It had probably been picked up and dropped, perhaps by a bird of prey. It didn't escape from the resin because when it hit it, it was already dead. As researchers started finding even smaller internal details preserved by amber, they began to ask themselves something almost unthinkable. Could amber have preserved molecular structures inside an animal, perhaps even its DNA? Some people even imagined that such DNA could bring monsters back to life. And look where that got us. But there are no remains of dinosaurs in amber. Surely their DNA is beyond our reach. The Poinars dared to wonder if that was so. The story begins 20 years ago, when Roberta first focused an electron microscope on an amber animal. Inside a fungus gnat, like the one in my piece of Baltic amber, she discovered something quite amazing. It's like a miracle. Every once uh, in a while in your life you witness something that's just too spectacular for words. And this was one of the times. The Poinars had found 40 million year old cells, and more than that, even the minute structures inside the cells were clear to see. The prospect of finding such ancient DNA electrified the scientific community. And Hollywood wasn't far behind. The storyline of Jurassic Park is very ingenious. My brother, who played the scientist, didn't actually need to find bits of dinosaur in amber. Nature had already extracted their DNA in blood cells and preserved it inside an amber mosquito. But that's pure fiction, isn't it? Surely it's impossible to recover DNA from any animal which lived in the distant past. Well, two teams set out to attempt exactly that. One of them included David Grimaldi. The other was set up by the Poinars. Both knew that their only chance of finding DNA was in the best preserved animals, so the Poinars chose to use my favorites, some stingless bees, while the other team decided to work on an amber termite. We had no expectations, at least I didn't, uh, when we did the study. 
uh, we did the extractions, we tried it. Um, several of the extractions were unsuccessful. But then both teams struck gold. Tissue extracted from the Poinars bees tested positive for DNA. And David Grimaldi got the same result from the termite. And our first reaction, particularly mine, was really disbelief. I was astounded at the possibility of DNA being preserved. It really was astounding. They were claiming to have recovered DNA from animals which had died 20 million years before. Not yet as old as the dinosaurs, but that's what a new team, including the Poinars, turned to next. And when they said what they had found, they caught the attention of the world. They had DNA from an insect older than T. rex. So could Hollywood possibly have got it right? We felt that the bringing back an entire dinosaur was not in the realm of possibility at this time. Barraged with the common question, when are you going to clone extinct organisms? And we constantly had to repeat ourselves, we're not going to do that. But why not? If DNA is indeed preserved in amber, it is so chopped up, so fragmentary, that it's impossible to reconstruct the entire genome and then insert it into some surrogate organism and then you know, have, have a complete resurrected extinct species out of that. That's, that's absolutely impossible. As the blaze of publicity surrounding the film faded, so other scientists tried to extract DNA from amber insects. And their results, when they were published, were bad news for the Poinars and David Grimaldi. None of them had found even a trace of ancient DNA. But what went wrong? What some of them found, in fact, were contaminant DNA sequences. And I have to admit, by that point, I was pretty much convinced that the original reports of DNA sequences in amber were of contaminant DNA. And some of the scientists that did to make an attempt got all kinds of strange things. They would get uh, uh, fish DNA. Well, perhaps they had a tuna fish sandwich that day and were, were careless. Like most other researchers, David Grimaldi has changed his mind. But George Poinar is still confident that a few rare pieces of amber do contain DNA. And some insects certainly could have drunk the blood of dinosaurs. These sandflies have been preserved in amber for a hundred million years. Who knows what might be inside them? And that is why amber fascinates me so much. It has brought us so many surprises. The prospect of it preserving DNA brought dinosaurs back, at least in our imaginations. And the creatures that traveled in it through time bring us vivid snapshots of the Caribbean forest as it was 20 million years ago. And my piece of Baltic amber, the first I ever owned, has preserved creatures with such perfection that they are still startlingly beautiful. What a journey Amber has taken me on. And it all came from a gift from a small girl over 60 years ago. I imagine Marianne and her father found my piece of Amber by walking along a Baltic shore just as thousands of people had done before them. It's magic may not extend to recreating a dinosaur, but for me, amber remains a substance of wonder, a time machine that can show us exactly how some things looked tens of millions of years ago.